How's it going, everybody? Andrew Zarian here, Wrestling Observer Live. We're here every day, Monday through Friday, 3 p.m. Eastern. Saturdays with Jim Valley, 1 p.m. Eastern. And Sundays, 6 p.m. Eastern. It's Sunday. It's 6 p.m. I'm here. It's me. Listen, a lot to talk about. Man, that New Japan show last night was something special. Uh, a lot of AEW crossover, which I absolutely loved, kind of setting you up for the pay-per-view that's coming up in a couple of weeks. Uh, wild. It's it's about a month and a half away, right? It's six weeks, five weeks away, which is pretty cool. Uh, we also have Double or Nothing coming up in two weeks, which I'm going to be there. And a lot of you guys are going to be there, too. We'll talk about that also. Uh, one of my good friends here doing the show with me. I think he's going to be there, too. Ryan Drosty, Top Rope Nation. I'm rocking the shirt here, Ryan. What's going on? I appreciate that promotion, man. I, I've learned when Andrew Zarian calls, you come running to the phone, my friend. And Listen, uh, I am very happy to be back. Uh, I, I think people should get to know you a little bit. I, I think it's, you know, we, we you've been on the show before, obviously. You've done stuff with Matt Men a bunch of times. But you're one of the, you do one of the podcasts that I genuinely enjoy listening to weekly. Uh, it's a fantastic show you guys do. Uh, Top Rope Nation. Why don't you tell people a little bit about it? First of all, the checks in the mail for that, Andrew. I that. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, <laughs> I need it. Yeah, man. We've <laughs> we've been doing the show for almost six years now. It's myself, Kyle Ross, Justin Joint. We have a good time every single week. And uh, you've been on Top Rope Nation a few times too. Got to get Rich on still. Now that yeah, I think man. About it, He's but... hard to track down. He's a busy boy now. His career's <laughs> blowing up with the photography and everything else he's doing. Did you, I had no idea. He wrote a, a poetry book years ago that I just ordered on Amazon. Uh, I just what? got it. Yeah, he never told me about this. Yes, he he's a man of secrets. You know, he's hard Please. to track down sometimes. He's like, yeah, you know, I wrote a book. I'm like, when? He's like, 2007. God, I would have like, never guessed that. He's never told me this. But uh, I'm glad you're here with me, obviously. Uh, there's so much happening in pro wrestling. Uh, you know, it, it it's so much fun to be a part of this. You know, to do the show, obviously, on Observer is, is a dream come true, really, for anybody that's followed professional wrestling media for you know growing up in this attitude era transitionary period in pro wrestling going from you know doink the clown and the repo man into this insanity of the late 90s right into the 2000s and then now uh it is an exciting time to cover wrestling you've been doing your show since 2016 i should know this because it's on my shirt right here um what you, if, you know out of all the just the time that you've covered it because i think i started like 2000 a couple years before you 2011 or 12 with the wrestling stuff but what, what's been the, the most exciting moment for you? Like, I, I think right now, you know, the uncertainty is kind of exciting. The fact that you're hearing rumors that, you know, MJF may be leaning to leave or other people, which we'll go into. But is this is this the most exciting for you as far as coverage goes? Or was there another error for you? Oh, 100%. At least from when I started doing the podcast, no question. I mean, once AEW launched, just having that other option. Now, we, we did cover New Japan you know, what was going on there in the early years of the podcast, but having another North American company that is this successful and to bounce back and forth between coverage has been a game changer. Just doing the podcast is so much more fun. You know, like I've been covering wrestling, at least in written form for a little over 20 years. And when I started covering wrestling, just writing, you know, it was the dying days of WWF versus WCW. So, you know, writing stories about the rumors of people jumping and stuff and then you know that was completely lost for years and years and years and so to have that viable product now to talk about some of the topics we're going to discuss tonight you know with mjf and other names and you know having cm punk return to the fold it is i guess since my childhood easily the most exciting time to be following wrestling and then yeah to be involved in this media sphere and meeting people like yourself and and doing these shows, it's a blast, man. Yeah, Can't I, ask for a time. I would say, you know, things got really... The reason why I started covering wrestling, and this is all going in, I swear to you guys, this is going into something, was a CM Punk pipe bomb. That that really revived it for me to want to talk. I, obviously, I watched it, I read about it, read The Observer, read all the sites. But for me to to want to start talking about it was that. And the the interest of like, oh, maybe, you know... Like, he's bringing up Ring of Honor, he's bringing up New Japan, like, this is new, this is different. Just the different part was enough to kind of give me that little boost to start covering it. Now, we're in a whole different period. 2016 to 2019, a lot of fun with wrestling, NXT, the boom, everything. But now, we are back into this 
who's leaving when their contracts are up scenario. And this goes right into the MJF story that came up uh, this week. Uh, I guess this this kind of started trickling in December. Uh, I think it was like December 15th. I was going through my notes to see when I was told about MJF, you know, maybe maybe wanting to, or, or interest in MJF. And it was probably mid-December. Somebody at one of the networks that, that I'm pretty friendly with over a couple of drinks was like, hey, uh, and, and the words that he used, I can't say on the radio. But he was like, hey, that that guy, uh, he's super impressive. What's his deal? When does his contract end? I hope that, you know, I would love to see him on WWE TV. And I, I brought this up to somebody over there and it was the same exact answer. You know, he's super talented. He's young. He is, uh, he has that look. He has the charisma. He's everything that they would want. And now the story is kind of manifesting itself. Per Fightful, a uh, friend of mine, Sean Ross Sapp reports, he is leaning towards leaving AEW when the deal is up. During the heated April discussion with AEW's head Tony Khan, MJF was, uh, MJF was said, and I quote, wasn't happy about his contract situation and the pay scale. This was after he did that interview with Ariel Helwani. He still he still has two years left on this five year deal. A little premature to talk about his deal. What do you think? Yeah, so I've always thought about this. You know, obviously he's a guy who WWE would target because he's so good. I mean, you'd be hard pressed to find a better heel in the business than MJF. But I wonder a lot about how he would fit into that WWE system. You know, like how much freedom would they give him on the microphone? Because that's what makes him so good. You yeah. know, he's very edgy. Would they allow him to push the envelope on WWE television? So that's one factor to me. He, the guy's so talented. If you give him some freedom, I have no doubt he would succeed at WWE. You know, and, and um, none, but, what, what, here's the other thing, right? You're talking about his charisma and his personality. So am I. Mm -hmm. His in-ring is great, too. Isn't it? Yeah. I mean, it, and, and he's really good in the ring. He's a fantastic heel in the ring. Like, nothing wrong with it. I, I, I watch his matches, and I'm, and I'm always impressed. He's always fantastic. Uh, I, I saw probably one of his first matches uh, on some indie in Long Island that I, uh, that I was, that I was working on. This is a guy that is so good as a character. We don't even emphasize his, his, how good he is in the ring. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Brian Myers trained him. Right. So you're neck yeah. of the woods right there. Long uh, Island boy. Yeah. 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 I mean, his personality is just larger than life. And so that's what you notice most of all, but yeah, his in-ring work is, is top notch too. So you got that. You mentioned, He's got two years left on his deal. What's going to be interesting is, look, AEW is, has made some stars in their short history, and some of these guys are going to have to get paid, and and women are going to have to get paid. And that's going to be around the time that their cable contracts come and do with TNT, too. So you look at AEW and, and what kind of money they're going to be able to get from Turner or potentially another network moving forward and how that factors into the negotiations that they're going to have to have. Uh, but I, you know, you look at MJF and what he's doing here, you can look at it two ways. It's really smart on his part because we have these other options out there. Now, two competitive national promotions, this is to the benefit of every worker in the industry. At the same time, I know the reports have kind of fluctuated about what's going on with him and Tony. Is this real? Is it a negotiating ploy? Um, you know, Will this factor into how he's booked in AEW moving forward? Because I think everybody has assumed he's a future world champion with AEW. They got a lot of a lot of guys that could be world champion. Listen, you know, Cody so we'll was Cody was Cody was assumed as well, right? Every, nobody right. nobody saw that coming. It really uh, some of the details about about this uh it, it's so amazing to me. And uh Cody expressed a lot of it on that Steve Austin interview he did, which I thought was a fantastic 2-hour interview with with Steve, but you know, I don't think anybody assumed or, or would have had that in their 2022 uh, prediction lineup that Cody Rhodes is going to leave AEW to go back to WWE and be positioned as their top babyface in the company. That wasn't a, <laughs> that wasn't a card that anybody had. But for MJF, I would say, I don't. This is my own opinion, right? And, and some of this is maybe drawn up with what other people have told me. I don't think it's this. MJF is leaving for sure scenario, right? He wants the best possible deal. He knows that this is the way to do it. WWE kind of enjoys uh, the WWE. I shouldn't say in kind of, they, they a hundred percent enjoy the back and forth and the turmoil with these deals. 
for AEW and anything that's going to cost Tony more money is a positive for them, even if they're not interested or they are. I don't know. Two years is a long time, but here's the interesting thing here, right? And you cover this all the time as well. AEW has a very short window of opportunity left for this contract negotiation. The deal obviously is over in 2024, right? Uh, what is it? November 2024, the deal's up. They have mm -hmm. two and a half years or so left on this. By the fourth quarter, they're going to have to do a full court press. Fourth quarter, first quarter to get these numbers up even higher than they are and really solidify these stars on TV to get, you know, whatever. I think Brandon Thurston uh, put out a post saying something like $140 million. I, I, I'm t I could be filling in the blanks here. But he brought up like $140 million value or $120 million value. Right now, they're around $48 million in TV rights fees, which is very low. And the mm -hmm. landscape is changing constantly for TV rights fees. But I don't see them going down with uh, re-signing with Turner. You know, I don't see that happening. They've lost some allies, obviously, with the restructuring of that company. But it, I don't think they're, they're in jeopardy of being canceled whatsoever. No, it's hard to imagine. I mean, just from their 18 to 49 ranking every single week, you know, top 10, top five, consistent, reliable programming that ranks that high on, on cable television. I, I, I don't think that they're going to be in any danger. But yeah, those numbers are going to be really, really interesting because it's going to play so heavily into the future of the company. These new stars they're building, like an MJF, with the contracts come and do, how much money can they offer them? Because you know, from WWE's side, you know, their, their pocketbooks are deep and they've got a global platform that for all of AEW's success is much larger. And, you know, it's a feather in their cap to sign some of these people away. And you got to imagine signing an MJF. I mean, that's near the top of the list. They got an EVP. They got Cody right now. If they can get an MJF, that's huge. I mean, who who else from the promotion that would jump as far as like homegrown stars would be as big as MJF? jumping do you think andrew homegrown uh you know what i gotta tell you darby allen would be i, I i'm not saying i don't i don't expect that to happen but like a darby allen yeah. would be a big one uh, i think more more than hangman at this point mm -hmm. i don't think hangman maybe hangman would want to go i don't know i i it depends on how they handle but i think like a big like wow pull the rug underneath that you don't see happening is is probably like a darby or a hangman as as far as any of the people that they've made on tv um, mm -hmm. I don't know. Who do you see? Give me like a big, give me like your two top guys that, that could go over there. That would be a hit to AEW. MJF for sure. I, I would say hangman as well. Um, on the women hang, and Darby but on the women's side, Jade Cargill, I imagine. And the oh, they love her year yeah. or so. I mean, she is going to be absolutely huge. You could see her just plugged right into WWE and be a massive star. I think on the women's side, she's going to be the one that they've, they've got to hang on to her. They've got to do whatever they can. I mean, she she's is, another one. is the star of the women's division well, moving she, forward, I think. She's another one that directly from WWE I was sold that they're super impressed with. They, yeah. they're, they're very, they, 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 I mean, just look at her and you say, my God, that's a, that's a, that is a TV attraction, you know, yeah. uh, attractive, the body, the phys I mean, just the overall presentation is fantastic. So, uh, I mean, how could they, how could they not want it? Talking about uh talking about AEW, let's go into Dynamite here because there was a lot that happened here on Dynamite that I very much enjoyed. Uh, live from Long Island, from UBS Arena, a couple couple minutes away from my house. I should have gone to the show. I just I had no time. I was going to ask you if you were there. I yeah. was in Manhattan. I was in Manhattan yeah. all uh all day, and I got home pretty late, so I didn't have a chance. But uh, very good show. It opened up Owen Hart uh Owen Hart Cup qualifier quarterfinals uh not qualifier I keep saying qualifier quarterfinals uh Adam Cole defeated Dax Harwood Dax was totally over here Cole won with a sharpshooter which was uh came out of nowhere I thought that was fantastic very good match CM Punk defeated the Long Island uh hero John Silver uh I thought you know this was an okay match it was a couple spots that were a little choppy but I thought overall the crowd was into this uh, they wanted, you know, they were very much behind both of them. CM Punk came out as a heel uh, with a with a <laughs> with an ironic uh, Islanders jersey of their former captain. A lot of people didn't understand this. That was their former captain that like abandoned them and went over to another team. So there was a lot of heat with that. 
Uh, CM Punk defeated. What did you think of that, by the way? Sorry to cut you yeah, off. Yeah, but what did ahead. you think about? Because they they didn't really point that out on commentary. So if you weren't an NHL fan, people are probably googling to see why is that drawing heat there. Yeah. So and, I, I just I happened to to know this. I'm not a big hockey guy, but like I knew because a couple of my buddies they're really big hockey guys. So I, I saw the jersey. I'm like, why are they booing him? I didn't realize until he turned around and I saw the name. I'm like, okay, that makes sense. Okay, but yeah. it worked out. I mean, it worked out. But definitely there was no mention on commentary. I don't think they even understood it. So uh, this was – No. <laughs> CM Punk loves hockey. So he, he got it. Uh, I and what do you think about – And what, yeah, Sorry. What do, you think about, what do you think about Punk continuing the heel bit in Long Island? Because it made sense when he was working MJF. I You know, I guess Silver, local guy too. But – is this going to be like the Bizarro World thing where he works heel all the time there? I hope so. I like that stuff. I'm into that. Yeah. I like I like him being a heel in, in the territory. And listen, they have a plethora of Long Island guys he could face every single time they come back. It's like endless. Yeah, that, that Half that roster is from Long Island. True. You know, so it, it's, it's interesting. Uh, we got CM Punk defeated John Silver. Adam Page came out, confronted him after. Tony Nese defeated Dan Housen in a total squash. But Dan Housen's theme is fantastic. He has such a great look. What a great comedic character. He gets squashed by him. Hook makes the save. Hook Housen now is a thing. What do you think of this? Do you think it's hurting Hook or hurting <laughs> Dan Housen? Or do you think this comedy, you know, team is going to work? I think it's fine. I mean, Dan Housen is super popular across the internet. All you got to do is check out YouTube. And you know, Hook already is mega mega popular i as a short-term thing i'm totally fine with it now i wouldn't want it to see it be like a long-term alliance or anything like that but i think for what it was him to come out coming out to the save there it, it was fine i like yeah it. i i liked it a lot too uh mjf wardlow contract signing i absolutely hate contract signings but this kind of this work because the crowd was so behind mjf and he was being such a pandering baby face which uh was awesome ftw champion uh ricky starks Defeated Jungle Boy for the FTW Championship. Chris Jericho Appreciation Society victory speech. It was interrupted by uh, BCC, Kingston, Santana, and Ortiz. Owen Hart, quarterfinal. Tony Storm defeated Jamie uh, Hayter. And it was, it, by the way, that was a great match. Very much yeah. enjoyed that match. Those two did a great job. And here's the main event, okay? And this is what I wanted to get to here. Uh, the, the quarterfinal, Jeff Hardy and Darby Allen. Jeff Hardy defeats Darby Allen. What an insane match this was. I don't know how this Darby Allen walks. That bump he took to the outside, oh flipping off the ladder to, I mean, he was barely caught. I mean, comes down across those chairs. This guy's insane, man. I mean, yeah, heck of a main event. Um, I... The one criticism I had, and they might have said it in passing. I need to rewatch this to see if they called it out. But this being part of the Owen tournament, you know, Jeff worked Owen early in he his did. career. What, yeah. 94, 95? He was a teenager. I would have been calling attention to that over and over. You know, here's Jeff Hardy actually worked against the great Owen Hart. Now he's here in the tournament trying to, you know, honor the man that he once worked against. I think that's a, a really good storyline that um, I didn't really hear called out. Maybe they mentioned it in passing, but I would have been harping on that a little bit. But yeah, overall, that main event was phenomenal. Yeah. You know, like if you're if you're just flipping around and trying to find something to watch and you come across that, I don't know how you couldn't stay tuned in. No, I thought they did a great job with it. Um a lot, I mean, questionable spots, you know, like that that chair spot that he jumped off the ladder, like that that looked nasty, mm -hmm. but listen, they they they're choosing to do it. Nobody else is making them do it. Uh some some news that came out of thir uh Wednesday also was that uh Tony Khan has the trio trios title made and ready to go. This was something that Cody mentioned during that first Jericho cruise that AEW was on. And they said that there were trio ti trio titles that were coming. Uh, and I think they were going to do it at that following Jericho cruise. I, I think that's yeah. what was alluded in that interview. I can't remember, but this was something they'd been working on and a lot of emphasis on the trios. This could become like a trios territory and I, and I'm fine with that. Oh, yeah, absolutely. They do a great uh, job. I'm, at I'm, yeah, I'm interested to see if that plays into the Japan show at all in Chicago when they introduce them. But, I mean, clearly you look at the roster right now and, and BCC has to factor into those plans, you would think. I, I wouldn't split that group up for a long, long time. No, no, keep them together. Keep, yeah. But, you know, like, are you are you taking away from those singles 
situations. I guess they're loosely associated, you know, they're not, they don't only exclusively have those matches. You'll see some singles, but I mean, that's cool. I, I like that stable. Yeah. I like that group put together. They also confirmed, Tony Khan also confirmed that Grand Slam will be returning to Arthur Ashe Stadium later this year, most likely September, same around the same time as last time. Uh, that's a, that's a, you, you got to experience that building, dude. It's a very unique experience in that, in that tennis stadium. You know, when I saw that announce, I'm not going to lie, Andrew, it passed through my, the thought came through my mind. I've, I've messaged you how many times I want to do a show in the Matt Men studio. Yeah. I'm like, should I travel to New York to experience Dude, this? You could Would add this the studio. Time? Absolutely. You could definitely do it here, but I'm going to give you a little tidbit. Okay. Do yeah. not stay near the arena around the stadium. Dude, people made a so huge much... mistake. People made yeah. huge mistakes. And I warned everybody, you're you're not in Manhattan. Okay. You're in you're in Queens. You're in like where the arena is, there's nothing. There's nothing around it. It is it is the park and it is junkyards. That it just there's a there's like a landlock happening with these landlords that they don't want to give up the space. So it's become a huge problem over the last twenty some odd years here in New York City. Nobody wants to give up that space. If you're coming for the show, stay in Manhattan. Don't stay in Queens. I'm telling you. Timeline, I was going to say my timeline on Twitter, yeah, was really split on this announcement because yeah. I know some people that were at the last show and they just thought it was the worst getting to the building. They all, you know, complained about the concessions and everything too. That wasn't AEW's fault. That wasn't. That was, the, that was the organizer, whoever the uh, the leaser of the concessions is. They, they totally dropped the ball. They didn't expect wrestling fans to eat and drink that the, the way they do <laughs> so but it looked phenomenal on television i mean they packed 20, yeah. over twenty thousand people into there i don't know how you could not go back oh I, I can't wait to go i mean it's like my backyard yeah. i'm in that i i six and a half minutes by train oh wow like i was i left a little early i didn't stay till the end because i had i had to get some work done i was home in like 15 20 minutes wow with my walk <laughs> You know, I didn't How many even. People I didn't are listening try. to this right now, shaking their fists I know, in the air. I, I was know. there I'm for sorry, two guys. hours trying I'm to get out. I'm sorry, home. guys. I'm sorry. You got to know the <laughs> tricks. You got to know how to get out. SmackDown on Friday was a pretty decent show. I very much enjoyed it. Uh, RK uh, RK Bro segment interrupted by Sami Zayn. Riddle defeated Sami Zayn. SmackDown Women's Champion Ronda Rousey defeated Raquel Rodriguez. Uh, they, this was this was pretty good. Uh, it was a little bit of a different show. The pacing felt a little different to me. Madcap Moss interview was interrupted by Corbin, who ended up uh, pilmanizing him with the Andre Trophy. Uh, WWE Women's Tag Team Champions Sasha Banks and Naomi defeated Natalia and Shayna Baszler. Butch defeated Kofi. The Bloodline confronted RKO, uh, RK Bro in the ring to set up the next week's title unification match. So... Let's talk about this title unification. You think it should happen? You think those titles should be unified, the tag titles? 100%. I'm I'm shocked they're doing it on SmackDown, though. And I I assume we're going to get a non-finish and then they'll rematch a Hell in a Cell. But I was a little surprised they announced it for SmackDown. But you know, pop a rating, maybe. I just think you look at that tag division, two champions. It's a real tough lift to justify having... Like, should RK Bro run that division for months i mean potentially the, the act is so over but they run out of opponents very very quickly now if you have a unified champion that you can bounce back and forth between the brands it stays a little bit more interesting i mean that's my big problem with wwe is just too many championships um i think there should be one male world champion there should be one female world champion there should be one tag team cha tag team champion and then you've got you know those uh what we would call mid card titles, but you know, you could, those could be the brand specific titles, the U S title and the IC title and, and make those important again. But I, I absolutely think they should unify these belts. Yeah. I, I, I'm, I feel the same. I, I think it's time to unify those titles. I, I don't, you know, I, I, I understand the defense to not because the defense here is, well, if one, it, it, what are you going to do on the other brand? Right. What are you going to do on the mm -hmm. other brand? If there's one title, well, you have a traveling champion. If you're the world heavyweight champion, you got to defend it on both shows. That's just how it is. And you don't have to be on both shows every time. You could have that, like you said, that secondary title be the lead for that show. But definitely one world title, one one tag title, and you call it a day. But they like having, you know, a lot of the problem here is like when a guy like Lesnar has that title, what do you do? 
That's the other thing is, and we're going to talk about this with the Roman reign situation, is the fact that Roman's going to be taking maybe some time off from TV and, and the premium live events. Doesn't that kind of show you that we don't need to have two world champions? You know, because if they're okay with the champions stepping away for weeks on end, why why do we need, you know, why do we need those two champions? So this this goes right into it. So let's talk about Roman. Uh, a lot of speculation over the last week and a half over what the situation Roman Reigns is. Uh, it was reported that Roman will be taking time off in the summer. Uh, that was the initial report. It was also reported that. And by the way, I don't want to. I don't know. I, I got to go down in my notes because the story that Dave reported kind of morphed into more than it was. Uh, with like, you know, the, the constant discussion online. So essentially Dave came on and he can kind of explained it as well, uh, over the last couple of days. And, and I spoke to someone at WWE that would, you know, gave me an official statement on this. So I'm going to, and I posted it, but pretty much Roman got a new deal. He's going to be doing less days, uh, overall, right? He's not going to be doing every house show. He's going to be on select house shows. Uh, he's going to be on most TVs, majority of TV. He's going to be on majority of the spe the pay-per-views. But there will be times that he's not on every show. Listen, that's just how every world, every solidified world champion has always been that. You know, now he's in a different phase. Like he said, that Trenton, New Jersey comment had more to do with localized in Trenton and not to do with like, hey, I'm going to be off TV for a while. It was more like, hey, I don't know when the next time I'll be at a house show like this is, but thank you. Um, I, I Listen, you, it's fine. I don't think there's a problem with this. I don't think uh, he's going to be off TV for significant weeks at a time. That's not what WWE said to me. They said he's off that Hell in a Cell pay-per-view for sure. He's not on that one. But do, maybe because they don't have the opponent, they don't need him. They're setting it up. He'll be on the stadium shows. He'll be in Cardiff. He'll be at Money in the Bank. He'll be at SummerSlam, which are the next ones. So that's not that's not affected. He there's a Saudi show coming up end of September October. I'm sure he's going to be on that. So th this this speculation that Roman is going to be off TV for you know four weeks or ten weeks or whatever whatever the speculation was six weeks that's not happening. But you know he's a big deal act and something that was said to me and I'm not putting numbers right. What's better for you, right? Let's say, Ryan, you're making, let's say you're making $10 million a year, right? My and God, your I last, <laughs> I know. In your last contract, you were making $5 million. Again, this is, these aren't Roman's numbers. Just throwing it out there. Instead of getting $15 million, right? Like, what's the difference between 10 and 15? At that point of, of money coming in, it, it makes no difference. So maybe you'll take $12 million with way less dates. Yeah. No, I mean, yeah, he's he's about our age, right? Late 30s. 30, yeah, late, late 30s. 30s. I just turned 38. Oh. My birthday was Friday. Oh, there you go. <laughs> so we're, exa we're I'm exactly the it. same age. We're exactly yeah. the same age. There you go. So yeah. uh, 36. Yeah, he's thinking sense, about though. himself. Yeah. You got young kids. If you can get the time off, why wouldn't you do this? I and mean, like he said, this is not unprecedented with wrestling history. We know that, you know, back in the day with WCW, Hulk Hogan, had quite the deal around 1997 where he would vanish, you know, go film some movies for Turner. Uh, we know that, you know, obviously you mentioned Brock Lesnar. There was a period, we just talked about this on Top Rope Nation this week, where Lesnar, I think he went six months as champion and only defended the belt once. I think it was late 14 into early 15. Yeah, but they so, had a second title but, belt at that point, right? Like yeah. that goes right into it. So, mm -hmm. uh, you know, Roman has the titles. Um there was that there was that story that came out in January. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, uh, right after WrestleMania, that they don't really have a lot of opponents set up for him, right? Listen, I I think if you if you are pulling Roman back from house shows and you're pulling Roman back from you know you're making him more of a special attraction, which I think he is a special attraction attraction at this point, and he has been for a while with this gimmick. But I don't see him doing a Lesnar. This is not a Lesnar deal at all. Like whatsoever, unless something changes totally. This I was specifically told. This is not like a Lesnar deal where he's doing like twenty days and that's it, or twenty. Six. He's still full time. He's just not gonna. He's just not gonna do smaller house shows, and he may take time off every now and then. 
but nothing extended. There's no extended leave happening. It's not like a John Cena disappearing for a couple months. Or like you said, Roman Reigns disappearing for a couple months. Uh, uh, Brock Lesnar. But, you know, with that said, you know, missing TV here, missing house shows there. Is this a negative for WWE, in your opinion? I think that their audience has gotten down to a size, you know, obviously still very profitable, where it feels like the brand draws. I think that they're going to do similar attendance and similar television numbers, regardless if Roman's there or not. It I agree with you. It seems like they've, they've hit that yeah. level. Well, you know, now they've done, they now realize, and this may force them to do this, they have to create another star. This booking of, you mentioned it, those three, four stadium shows in a row. I mean, this is going to be a really, really interesting summer, not just for, I mean, WWE and AEW, but you look at what are they going to do at Money in the Bank? You know, who's challenging at SummerSlam? Then you got that big show at the UK. We know that uh, Drew has been talking about doing stuff with Tyson Fury. You got Roman as the champion. Cody is that ascendant new star that you want to capitalize on. I mean, to me, you look at that Money in the Bank show, makes a lot of sense for Cody Rhodes to win Money in the Bank. Well, yeah. Potentially it, challenge at SummerSlam. Or 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 actually, you, you saw that you saw that commercial for Money in the Bank, right? Where which yeah. started this whole speculation as to the rule change possibly happening. In that commercial, and I and I recommend you guys check it out. They're you know, they're talking about money in the bank, and Cody says something along the terms of um it gives you an opportunity to headline WrestleMania, right? Money in the Bank. Mm -hmm. Now, is he talking about, is that the new rule change where if you win Money in the Bank, you become the number one contender for the title of WrestleMania? Or is he saying that this would be what he would want to do, right? Or, I mean, the reality is, yeah, it's always been what he says. There's nothing different with what Cody said because if you do cash, if you do get Money in the Bank, you have two opportunities to headline WrestleMania. One, as the champion going into it, or two, as somebody that challenges with the money in the bank. So there's really no, like, this isn't like a big revelation. It's always been possible, right? Mm -hmm. But I think yeah. this is more, now it's like, well, there's a lot of gray here. When I asked people, they said they don't know. Nobody, nobody knew of any kind of rule change. And a couple of the conversations were like, maybe this is just Cody's line. Because somebody wrote it for him. Yeah. No, I'm, it's going to be really interesting if Cody wins it because I very firmly want to see him do it where he declares ahead of time he's challenging for the title. Whether that's WrestleMania, I hope they don't wait that long. <laughs> him and Dwayne. It's him and Dwayne at Mania. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but like, I, there's there's such a compelling argument that Cody should be the guy to beat Roman to establish another top star because he's so hot right now. And how long can you wait to do that? Roman's run through pretty much everybody on the roster like you said he doesn't have a lot of challengers right now that are believable cody is a guy who right now has been protected i mean we get a whole another discussion going about hell in a cell and the rollins feud but i mean you got to protect this guy he would be believable defeating him for the title and then it would firmly establish him as a main event player moving forward if he's the guy to topple roman reigns but I, d I don't want to see him do the cheap victory thing that we've seen so many times, it pretty much as a heel gimmick, to cash in after somebody's wrestled a grueling match and yeah. win the title that way. I want to see him declare in advance, we're doing this at SummerSlam, you know, kind of in the same way that RVD did with One Night Stand or, you know, that we saw Big E do. Like, that's the kind of thing that, you know, I, I want the challenge laid out. It looks like the babyface thing to do. You pop the numbers for it and... Yeah, if you're asking should me, he be the I guy? Cody runs the. I I think so personally. No, I do. Well, uh, let me let me. Should the match be at WrestleMania with him and Roman? Because uh, or who does Roman drop the title to? You know, before would, that or I, after yeah. that. You know, like that. There's yeah. a lot of uncertainty because there's also the Rock. That's the big mix for LA. You know, if they're ever mm -hmm. going to do it, this is the year. Los Angeles, big movie star Roman, uh, Dwayne. You know, night two of WrestleMania. I mean, what gets bigger than that? Yeah. I mean, I would have Cody beat him this year. They could move the title back to Roman before the Rock match if they want that to be a, a championship match at Mania. Probably doesn't need the title, but at the same time, well, I mean, it definitely doesn't need the title. But this is WWE, Roman Reigns. If you get him in a match with the Rock, you know they want it to be a championship match. Uh, God, Rock hasn't wrestled in a long time. Like and years, yeah. I know that's the plan, and he got injured the last time too. Bad and bad, <laughs> really yeah. bad. I mean, 
that was a that was a very painful injury for him to get. I mean, he's a big jacked up dude. You know, this happens. But I don't know. Yeah. Uh, very. I hope they do it right with Cody, because I don't want this to turn into some sort of Cody rejection, as far as the fans go. Because WWE needs a baby face like him. Yes, you this know, is so, what they've struggled with for so yeah. many years: is building a baby face. And for a promotion that used to be built on baby faces, it has been well over a decade since they have built a top babyface star because you look at the ones that they had and they were kind of like accidents you know daniel bryan brian danielson that, that was, was a total yeah a total fluke yeah CM not a fluke by him yeah. i mean he's fantastic but it was the fans it wasn't in there it wasn't in their cards same with kofi and there's another guy who you watch smackdown on friday night would you ever guess kofi kingston was the world champion a couple of years ago unbelievable you know right? like we were doing this watch party with some of our top rope nation listeners and we were commenting so much about if you would have told people a couple of years ago, Kofi Kingston and Pete Dunn, that would be like an amazing match you would look forward to. And here, you know, on SmackDown, it's Kofi. You never knew he was world champion and done with the name change. It's just a whole different world. You know, and this is this is what AEW does. And, I, you know, I'll probably get a lot of detractors here that come after my detractors will come after me. Uh, AEW does a 10 time better job at presenting a nothing match where you know how it's going to end and make it into something that you want to see. Mm -hmm. I'll give you a great example. John Silver and CM Punk, right? Oh, if that yeah. match happened on a SmackDown, okay, in the same placement of the, of the match, would anybody care? Would the crowd be into it as much as they were, even though it's a Long Island guy and CM Punk is playing the heel? I'm telling you, no. It wouldn't happen. We see these matches constantly. G great match. I'll give you an example of a match that I, you know, that that I think anywhere any, any other promotion would be a big deal. Co um, Mustafa Ali and Ricochet, right? Yeah. Isn't that a match you're like, oh man, you know, I kind of want to see these guys, and it That's turns like a, into a it, nothing. Yeah, yeah. You would you would seek that match out. You know, if it happened on a independent somewhere, you know, you like, I got to get, I got to yeah. get the tape. I got to find a streaming. I have to see this. These two it, high flying dudes that are great workers. And not, and, and yeah. not that the match is going to be bad in WWE because I, I believe they had that match and it was a great match. Um, mm -hmm. It is the conditioning of the audience to not care. It's not Roman yeah. Reigns. It's not the main event. It's not a legend. I don't care about it. I could, I could, it, it doesn't matter if the match is good or not. And that's bad conditioning because you look at, uh, let's look at Rampage, okay? Rampage really didn't have much on it. Scorpio Sky defeated Frankie Kazarian in this in a fantastic, fantastic main event. I watched it. I said, man, this was a great match. The crowd was into it. They were into it. This happens on a SmackDown, or or give me give me a secondary show. What what would be uh what would be a WWE secondary show? Uh, main event. Main event. Yeah. Would you care? No, you wouldn't. Nobody would care. No. I said that to them, by the way. Uh -oh. I told them that. I'll tell you <laughs> off the, the heat. Air. Yeah, I'll, okay. I, I said that. I, I brought it up. I was like, listen. I go, you guys. <laughs> I don't want to go into details where I was and how the scenario conversation happened, but I really want. I was like, guys. I go, you have you have like the best talent in the world, no question about it. Like the top top talent, and. You and I told him, I go, you guys forgot how to book male wrestlers. They they really the did. Characters. They, they, the characters they, are over the top, too much over the top. You know, Happy Corbin, Madcap Moss. I just don't understand where and, this and stuff comes from. There's there is a there is a segment of their majority of their population that's into it, right? And a lot of the kids would be into it because they're cartoon matches. That Johnny mm -hmm. Knoxville match at WrestleMania where I said would be the dumbest thing for them to do. I don't want to see this match. I don't want to see this match. It was the most entertaining match to nearly every casual fan <laughs> that I spoke to in my family. You know, like my father, yeah. he's been watching wrestling since the 60s. Okay. He loved that stupid match. My kids love that stupid match. All my friends' kids loved it. All my friends loved it. And I'm looking at it. I'm like, it's, it's just like a, it's a crash test dummy. You know, it just gags and spots. And that's all it was. But guess what? That's what got over. I had the same experience, exact same experience. My dad was watching that show with me, also been watching since the 60s. Um, my daughter, who I'm taking to her first house show in about a week, 
she was just laughing hysterically during that. And yeah. going into the show, I like on our podcast, I was very negative on it. Like jackass. And Same stuff. From 20 I, years I, ago. And I'm not into that humor. I'm not into like, yeah. you know, uh, like the whole jackass stuff. It never did it for me. I'm not poo-pooing on your parade, guys. You can love it all you want. It just never did it for me. <laughs> but I watch it. I'm like, this is great. This is fantastic. I, I mean, it served its purpose. I said afterwards, look, I was wrong. <laughs> that yeah, was very same, entertaining. I had the, same, you know? I had the same, same thing. Not everything is a five-star match. You know, New Japan yeah. last night had a fantastic show, Capital Collision. You set up. I mean, that main event was great. Yeah. By the way, Juice Robinson, uh, new uh, U.S. champion. Fantastic mm -hmm. stuff. Uh, Filthy Tom, fantastic stuff. I mean, the card was great. I gotta, I gotta finish watching it. I, I don't want to spend too much time. I, the Ishii stuff, you gotta watch Ishii and Eddie Kingston. Great match. They beat the crap out of each other. Uh, Leo Rush is now entering the junior heavyweight division. He, you know, he wants that title. You set up a Bullet Club uh, and Chaos. You did that match. So there were a lot of moving parts here. This is, this is the wrestling I like. But I could also sit back and appreciate some of the stuff that's not for me. I could be like, you know what? That's not for me, but that kind of worked. But my conversation with them was like, listen, you, you haven't done a good job. And I brought up the Mustafa Ali situation. I was like, you know, you got a guy there that people kind of want to see wrestle, uh, especially the, the, you know, fanatical wrestling fans. And you got a guy like Ricochet and you got all these other people on that roster. But you don't put any emphasis on those matches. Any, any, other, any other territory, these would be big time matches. If you're not Roman, you're not Drew, you're not Randy or or uh, Matt Riddle, or, or now obviously Co um, uh, 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 Cody and uh, Seth, yeah, they don't care. Mm -hmm. It's an attraction, right? You're coming for Hogan. It, it's almost like they treat it like boxing, right? Yeah, it, it, it's true. it's kind like of you... fallen back into that. Like you're there <laughs> for the Tyson Fury fight. Give me, yeah. give me, who was on the undercard? Nobody knows. <laughs> How many, like, growing up, you know, how many Tyson matches did you watch where, like, I have zero memory of anything else that was on None. the shows? None. None. <laughs> zero. And, and I came from, like, a heavy boxing family. My grandfather was a boxer on one side. My other grandfather was a bodybuilder. Don't look at me. I, I've totally failed all of my, my relatives here. <laughs> I just talk about wrestling. My father, my father was a bodybuilder. My grandfather was a bodybuilder. My other, my other grandfather was a boxer. So, like, we were very much into this whole combat sports stuff. My, they used to watch it all the time. Nobody knew who, who was on the undercard. They would just know, like, oh, that guy's good. He's in a, he's he's fighting. Like, nobody cared about it. And that's what's kind of happened here with the casuals. Yeah, They don't I care mean, about anything else guys, except for the main event. Right. And some of those guys, again, like, they have that role. Not everyone has to be world champion. You can thrive in that mid-card or upper mid-card role. But then there's some other guys who could top out as at least legitimate contenders for a world championship. And that's where we're running into problems because you try to forecast the next six months in WWE. And especially if you go back, if you go back to two world champions, I mean, who are your guys challenging for months on end? It gets really, really thin. So at some point you got to elevate these people. And when they've been middling around on the mid card in these matches that are good, but they don't really have much backstory, like that's always my comment when we're reviewing pay-per-views is that you go into a WWE or premium live event. Sorry, Andrew. Premium live event. A PLE. PLE whatever yeah, yeah. I, I, you know, I got, I got a DM from somebody, and this person wrote, "This is further proof you're on the payroll, right? You're on WWE's <laughs> payroll." Which is funny because two weeks ago I was on, you know, somebody was like, "Hey, Tony, when, when are you sending Andrew's yeah. check?" I'm on the WWE payroll because I call it a PLE. And that I, I don't say the WWE ever. I say WWE. Yeah. That was his proof. <laughs> it's amazing. <laughs> it's so like conspiracy theorists. It's just amazing. To yeah. Hear. But yeah, no, I've, I'm I've had it. that stuff. Give me too. more conspiracies. <laughs> I've had that stuff too. And it's just like, look, I'm going to call it the proper terminology because on the other side, other people are going to come after you and, and they're going to be wanting to take you down. No, it's PLE now, pal. Get it right. You're in the yeah, wrestling yeah. media. You don't know the terms. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But like I always say, you go into those shows and look, you know, they're going to be really good events. They're going to be full of great matches. But in the end, are you ever going to go back and watch those events again? Because like how many times growing up did you watch pay-per-views multiple times? Multiple like times, I did this yeah. all the time. And there's been very few shows WWE wise in the last couple of years where I would go back and revisit anything, even though there was great undercard matches like in the moment. I'm like, oh, yeah, it's about a four star match or close to a four star match. 
And then you ask me six months later, and I have zero memory of what was on those events. And I can, me I mean, I can go through the old events. Give me a modern pay-per-view that you've gone back more than twice to rewatch it. In the last, let's do 20, let's do last four years. Mm, man, on the WWE side, it's... 2018 on. Oh, my God. <laughs> I can't I think got of any one. on WWE. I got one. Don't Which mind, one? don't mind the food coloring all over my hands. I got one. People are gonna think I'm nuts. Uh, 2019 Royal Rumble. I'm sorry, 2020 Royal Rumble. Oh yeah. I have gone back and watched that Rumble match four or five times. I did watch that one a couple of times. Just the match, not the whole show. Just the match because it yeah. was so unique. It was yeah. so unique. It was so different. I actually really, really liked that. I think that that Rumble's top five all time. I I'm gonna tell you, 92 still my favorite, mm -hmm. but I think 2001 was better then 92 but 92 is my favorite i would do 2001 after that and i would put uh 2020 right underneath yeah it's right there that's how much i enjoyed 100%. it because it was unique it was different right very yeah. cool stuff yeah, that's what i liked about it too it's uh, memorable you yeah know, how many of the other rumbles just kind of blend together and then you can differentiate them but that one right when you say 2020 but everybody knows everybody everybody knows. knows yeah uh listen a lot of stuff going on here obviously um a lot of moving parts. You're going to be in Vegas in two weeks. I am. So am I. Look, I'm going to be there looking also. Looking forward to seeing you. Uh, are looking you stopping by the sweet party? Beverages. Yeah. Are you stopping uh, by the sweet party? You got to. Garrett and I are I hosting it. You got to. You got to come I might be there. So, yeah. Uh, if you guys cool. are out there, say hello. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we're doing a sweet party at the Cosmo. All the details on Wrestling Observer's website. You can check it out there. I'll have more information this week on We're Live Pal with the final uh what what we're gonna be doing plan. Uh but I'm going to I'll be at uh I'll be at Rampage, I'll be at uh the pay per view on Sunday, then I'm getting on that first flight in the morning to Los Angeles and I'm spending two days in LA for work. So uh, I got a busy couple days that week. But Ryan, where can people find you? Where what where can people hear you? Hopefully they're gonna be hearing you a lot more soon. Uh, you're always up to something new, which is fantastic. I always love it. And you keep the show fresh. So where can people check it out? Yeah. Thanks again for having me, man. Uh, yeah. Find me at Ryan Droste on Twitter. That's D-R-O-S-T-E. You find the show at Top Rope Nation everywhere, Instagram, Twitter as well. Uh, look us up wherever podcasts are found. We usually drop a new podcast every single Friday. And uh, you can find me in, in Vegas tagging along with Garrett and Andrew, hopefully. Love it. Love it. And and Garrett is uh I have a lot of tag partners here. You're you're a tag I, I I'm always changing my team. <laughs> you know, it's like it's like when the Rockers, you know, when the Rockers kind of broke up, Marty Jannetty had like 18 other tag partners. That's what I'm doing now. <laughs> Don't oh my god. Don't tell me I'm the uh Leaf Cassidy. You're the, the Leaf, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. No, you know what? You're Flash <laughs> Funk. I think you've teamed up with Flash Funk once at a house show. <laughs> nice <laughs> guys you can follow me on twitter at andrew zarian obviously you can check out this show everywhere podcasts are available very soon by the way this is going to be available probably within the next day or two so uh we'll have some more information on that and everything else that we're doing here at f4w and wrestling observer we're out of time guys see you next time take care